Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, the latest European Parliamentary Research Service book talk. And in fact, it's the first in a new mini series that we're doing called Transatlantic Book Talks. And of course, like all our book talks at this moment, it's an online event. And thank you already to the 65 people who are tuned in and hopefully more that will join uh, as this event progresses. And we're particularly delighted to have as our guest speaker today, Fiona Hill, who has written this book, which is called There is Nothing for You Here, Finding Opportunity in the 21st Century. And the book is part memoir, part uh, account of the, if I may say so, slightly zany uh, experience of working at the heart of the Trump administration. But it's also a political treatise because it deals with one of the most difficult and fundamental issues facing democracy at the moment, which is the progressive disillusionment of part of the voting public in industrialized democracies and the way in which that not only feeds the populist process, but is more generally representing an erosion, if you like, of democratic values and traditions in our advanced industrial democracies. And to discuss this with her, we're delighted to be joined by two distinguished members of the European Parliament, Jens Geier from Germany and um, Sandra uh, Kalnieti from Latvia, both of whom have held very important jobs in their own domestic political systems, as well as contributing to the work of the European Parliament since they became MEPs in 2009. And their remarks will also be complemented uh, by those of Anaya Benson, uh, who's an EPRS policy analyst who's currently based in the Washington office, EPLO, of the European Parliament and has a specialism in disinformation. Joe Dunn, who's the head of that office in Washington, will be curating the discussion after we hear from our guest speaker. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Fiona to talk a little bit about why she wrote the book and what she hopes to achieve by the messages which she communicates in it and whether she's been pleasantly surprised by the broad international acclaim, I would say, that the book has elicited. Over to you, Fiona. Um, well, first of all, um, Anthony, it's just such a pleasure to be with everyone. I'm very excited to be sort of virtually in Brussels at this moment and uh, everywhere else that people are, are zooming in from. Uh, it's one of the great um, achievements of uh, what's otherwise been a pretty grim period over the last several years that we managed to connect ourselves so well using technology that perhaps we wouldn't have envisaged. And it's not just um, the, the, the technology that Naja is uh, following for disinformation purposes, but we can use it for information purposes and certainly broader communication. So I'm really delighted. It's such an honor to be with Sandra and Jens uh, and uh, as well as uh, Joe and Naja, in addition to you, uh, Anthony, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to speak to everyone. And that actually gets to the you know, heart of the last bit of your question. I've been um, actually amazed by um, the response uh, to the book um, so far. I mean, it's been a little bit difficult with distribution issues. Um, you know, the, the books are on that supply chain problem as well, lacks of paper and all kinds of things. So the actual physical publication of the book has been quite difficult, apart from in the United States. Uh, but I have been you know, impressed by how many people have actually read it. And I've, I've got hundreds of, of emails and Letters from people talking about the way that the book has resonated <clears throat> with them precisely because of the issue that you touched upon, which was, you know, one of the goals in writing the book. But I thought I'd taken something of a risk in writing it from more of a personal perspective. Before the pandemic hit, I'd been mulling over the book and I want to, you know, basically say why. In fact, I'd been thinking about these themes in the book since 2016 when uh, President Trump was first elected in the United States, but even going back before that to the Brexit referendum in the United Kingdom, where obviously I grew up and spent you know, the, uh, my um, youth and um, and adolescence and also in, in college at university in St Andrews. I came to the United States in 1989. So obviously at a pretty momentous <clears throat> moment, I arrived in September. Within a couple of months, the Berlin Wall had come down and you know, the Cold War was in its uh, final throws and you know, the whole world changed. Uh, so it was a pretty momentous time, <clears throat> not just for me, but for you know, Europe overall. But I'd gone through in the time in which I was in you know, the United Kingdom growing up, a periods of pretty wrenching dislocation and change on, from my own family perspective. My father was a coal miner. Uh, the title of the book, There's Nothing For You Here, is something that he said to me in 1984 when I was leaving school. Um, basically, in 1984, there was a mass youth and employment crisis in the UK. 90% of kids who were leaving school then had nothing else to go on to immediately. It didn't mean to say they wouldn't eventually find something, but on that day when they walked out of the school gates, 
90% of them had nothing uh, ahead of them. They didn't know what they were going to do. They were looking for opportunity, the subtitle of the book. And I was one of the lucky ones. I was in that 10% who had something because an opportunity to go to university. And despite the fact that I came from the lowest possible income bracket in the United Kingdom, the fabric of society at that point in the UK, uh, which made it possible for me to go to university on the basis of means testing, I got a grant from my local education authority to pay for my education at university, something which is actually very hard to come by, you know, these days. And that put me on this uh, incredible educational trajectory where I went from St Andrews University in Scotland to Harvard University on a scholarship and also spent a year in the Soviet Union. I mean, Sandra, you know, kind of coming from Latvia, that period was in uh, the Soviet uh, space, not by choice, of course, but um, I basically ended up in Moscow in 1987. Uh, for a year, a sort of study abroad, funded again by the British Council. So, you know, the whole point of my educational odyssey was that it was underpinned by monies that came from, you know, the government and government grants at different money uh, points. I'd actually got some small amounts of money from the European Union as well, because when I was 10 years old, when the UK uh, joined the EU. So for me, it was actually quite shattering to see the UK pull out of, uh, of the European Union because, you know, part of my own education had been made possible by structural funds for school exchanges. I'd spent time in Germany in Tübingen and also in Ivry-sur-Seine, one of the banlieues of Paris, all on exchanges that were funded in part by the European Union. I knew who my member of the European Parliament was. You know, there was a great excitement, you know, kind of in certain circles about what the EU could provide. And I was spending my whole time trying to explain to myself, well, what exactly happened here? And I felt I could explain it from the experience of growing up in the Northeast England of a time of massive dislocation. So as I was leaving school, 90% of school leavers not having a job, hundreds of thousands, uh, mostly of men, of course, but that had the knock on effect to their families, had lost their jobs, closing down of all the uh, former nationalised industries as they were privatised in the 1980s. The steelworks, the coal mines, the shipyards, uh, the railway works. I mean, it's you know something, as you said, that is very familiar in other industrial societies. And when I got to Russia and the Soviet Union, I saw that that, that was falling apart as well. And in the 1990s, when I was already studying at Harvard and I was doing a lot of research on Russia, and that became you know, part of my PhD, was looking at Russia's obsession with itself as a great power and looking at the transition in uh, Russia after it became a successor state to the Soviet Union in a historical context, I realized that, that Russia was going through exactly what I'd experienced in the northeast of England. Northeast of England being, you know, obviously a bastion of nationalized industry, Soviet Union being nationalized industry, you know, writ large, and in the privatization process in the 1990s, millions of people losing their jobs, their sense of identity and their livelihood, which is tied to work. And, you know, I saw the same phenomenon. And then later in the United States, I saw the same forces at work in places like the Midwest, you know, what's now called the Rust Belt, which, of course, wasn't the Rust Belt, you know, for the entirety. It was used to be the industrial heartland of mass manufacturing industry, not nationalized, of course. But what you saw was similar phenomena at work. And so when uh, the 2016 election came along, not only was I, from my professional perspective, following very closely Russian disinformation, propaganda, uh, the influence operation, but I was also seeing this upswell of grievances that um, I'd seen behind uh, many of the votes from my own family in my own town and region for Brexit, in which the idea of taking back control was more about, well, now we'll finally get some money to dig us out of the massive hole that we've been in, you know, since the 1980s, although actually most of the money coming to my hometown was coming through the European Union, which just was not known. It was because, of course, the spin in uh, in London and Westminster that so much money was going to Brussels, it was going to Poles and Bulgarians and Latvians and, you know, you know, you know, who were not coming to people of the Northeast, so that if uh, there was a vote against Brexit, then there would be a rush of money, not just to the National Health Service, but also for reconstruction in these places that have been devastated and forgotten for, you know, essentially 40 odd years. And in the United States, same phenomenon. Many of the people who voted for Trump, they weren't voting because they were manipulated by Russian operatives. They were voting because they felt the same way that they'd been left behind, ignored, and that, you know, the Democratic Party in particular had moved on into a different place to become a party of elites that they could not relate to. And so the same forces were at work. And after I had this very strange experience, which I also relate in the book, you know, I start with, 
my experience of um, being witness at the first impeachment trial, first impeachment trial, because of course it was the second after that, of President Trump. And of course that was about ostensibly the privatization of national security, the efforts of Trump to get the Ukrainian government to help him, you know, basically get reelected again in the 2020 presidential election. I also, because of the partisan infighting, the polarization that I experienced and witnessed, I realized that everything was coming to a head. And I felt that I had to try to sort of put all of this together and explain it in some way. And that's why, you know, I came out of there and thought, I've got to write this book. Well, thank you very much for setting the scene so nicely with that. And I should say for those who have now joined us, we're around 100. Uh, Fiona Hill is talking about this book, There Is Nothing For You Here, Finding Opportunity in the 21st Century, which, as I mentioned earlier, is kind of part memoir and part implicit political manifesto. Part of it also relates to her own experience working in the National Security Council of the White House when Donald Trump was president. And of course, in addition to that book, she's also written a biography of uh, Vladimir Putin, operative in the Kremlin, which she did from her perch in the Brookings Institution, to which she returned after her White House service. And she's being joined now for a, a conversation with uh, Jens Geier, who's Member of Parliament here in the European Parliament from Germany, SPD. He's been a member since 2009, where he heads up the German SPD delegation as a member of the Industry Research Energy Committee, ITRE, and of the a substitute member of the Budgets Committee, and by Sandra Calniete, also a member of the European Parliament from Latvia since 2009, member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, member of the Subcommittee on Security and Defence, former very distinguished uh, diplomatic career in her own country, culminating as a uh, foreign minister. And she's also author of a book, uh, several books, but most notably in this context, Song to Kill a Giant, Latvian Revolution and the Soviet Empire's Fall, which I believe has been translated into very many different languages. So very hearty welcome to you and thank you for sharing your thoughts uh, in reaction to what Fiona has already said. And then we'll go on to continue in conversation style, which is going to be moderated by Joe. So I wonder uh, if in the first instance, uh, if I could hand over to Jens, uh, whether or not what um, Fiona's just said has an echo in terms of the political experience which you yourself have had, and indeed which you continue to grapple with. Quite a, <clears throat> quite a lot. Um, about 100 years ago, my hometown Essen was the biggest mining city in the world. And um, perhaps as a little side note, in fact, the coal that came to the surface in the Ruhr Valley this coal bed is going down to the north, uh, to the northwest, under the North Sea, coming again to the surface on the British side. So, Fiona, where your dad, the in the mines where your dad worked, they were working on exactly the same coal bed that the miners in in the Ruhr area, just from opposite sides of the. Uh, of the Northern Sea. But what I can absolutely understand is, and, and what I share as an experience, is that miners um, see their job as identity. And they have been uh, undignified by uh, the processes of deindustrialization to an extent that is hard to understand uh, for people who have never been down in a coal mine. I've never worked there, but I was always impressed when I had the opportunity to go down a mine thousand meters under surface and look at what people are doing there. It was um, always a, a, a very special um, experience and it always, I always said to, to friends, when you want to understand the region, take the opportunity, go down there. Then you know why the, peop why the people are the way they are, why the cities look the way they are and um, well we had the same experience we substituted more than 200,000 working places in the rural area from coal mining and steel steel production and we did it with much less social friction than we have heard from from Fiona and I think it is um, basically for four reasons money time political will and um, also employees participation what is uh, um, a, a legal thing in germany that in, in industrial enterprises um, the uh, the employees have a say and they can simply uh, it's called mitbestimmung in in, in in german and it is simply 
uh, a way to influence the way an enterprise takes. And we are not ready. We are working on the, the um, economic uh, reestablishment of the region since the 1960s. So it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of effort. We are still not so good in uh, prospering than, than the other parts of Germany. Unemployment is still a little bit higher than the average. Um, the welfare um, level is still a little bit below Germany, but people get along. And um, um, it, is, it is due to that. In my hometown, it depends in which quarter you are. There are quarters who are doing excellently and there are quarters who feel left behind. And uh, part of this undignifying process, in my opinion, is that people not only get frustrated how they are handled, whether they lose their job or not, and how good the social safety net is, that all pays in. And also here we have significant um, uh, the, the significant difference between Great Britain and the Thatcher area and uh, a social more justice uh, German situation. But it also comes, in my opinion, from the frustration of the neg negligence of the public goods. So the way the schools look, the way the streets are, the way the public services function is part of the problem whether people feel uh, undignified or feel that they are part of a society and have a say. And probably we managed a little bit to do that in a more positive way than, than uh, that it has happened in, in, in the Rust Belt uh, or in the northeast of, of Britain, but it is a different political mindset and a different political system. And also, I have to say, it's not working on every quarter uh, of the Ruhr area. But when I sum it up, we are quite happy with what we have achieved because we have reinvented uh, the region economically, socially, and also, I have to say, ecologically. And it works to some extent. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and uh, Sandra, we'd be delighted to hear your perspective and how much of an echo you found in the book from the various themes that um, uh, Fiona has been exploring. Thank you and uh, dear Fiona, dear all. Um, I should say that the invitation to discuss your new book, There is Nothing for You Here, is a great honor and challenge at the same time. In fact, I needed a day or two to just come to grips but the thought of sharing my thoughts with the honorable Fiona Hill, an extraordinary Russia expert with an unparalleled track uh, record of true and nonpartisan expertise, that my paralyzing sense of respect for you uh, transformed also into great interest and, dare I say, enthusiasm over reading your book. Your book is rich in scope and in substance as it touches upon numerous issues, the origins of which can be traced to the post-war World War II period and the Cold War. The neglect or inept engagement with these issues lies at the root of the current state of democracy globally. Democracy is in retreat, in retreat around the world, and it is increasingly challenged within both in the United States and in Europe. And I was listening with great interest to, to your introduction and also what Jens said about Essence experience. And therefore, it is more important than ever that like-minded countries and societies unite forces to protect our common values, democracy, freedom, the rule of law, and respect to human rights. And we must spare no effort in building resilience against foreign interference and hostile disinformation by malicious actors. Our adversaries seek to exploit vulnerabilities inherent to our democratic institutions, systems and societies to divide us, polarize us, even radicalize us. We cannot let that happen. Dear Fiona, 
I was struck by your clear and lucid writing, which could explain incredibly complex professional situations and subjects in a way that is accessible, even witty at times. I am also very inspired by your approach in weaving your personal narrative into the exploration of broad, far-reaching political and social issues. This is a great way to build a connection with readers who are distant from the world of international politics and structural problems. You have successfully managed to bring down highly complex issues and concepts to the everyday level. For myself, personal experience is also the root of my commitment to upholding democratic principles. The words spoken by your father, there is nothing for you here very much true for my upbringing in Soviet Union. If Latvia had never managed to recover its independence after half a century of Soviet totalitarianism, my life and career would have been entirely different. Because I was born in Stalin's Gulag in Siberia with the label of the enemy of the people on my forehead. I was destined for a life of captivity without the freedom of movement as my parents had to register me twice a month in the local KGB office to make sure that I had not escaped, a baby not escaped. Yet the passage of history can sometimes offer a different fate. In 1957, my family was allowed to return to still occupied Latvia. I was at the age of 37 when I freed myself of forced Soviet brainwashing and in 18, Eight joined the Latvia's fight for freedom, becoming, becoming one of the leaders of the independence movement. Following the restoration of independence, I served in the diplomatic service of my country, first as an ambassador, later as a foreign minister. I still find it unbelievable that the signature of a girl born in the Siberian snows lies on the Treaty of Latvia's accession to the European Union. It was equally unbelievable that I, with tears in my eyes, could give a look of gratitude from the balcony of the U.S. Senate to every brave U.S. Senator who voted for Latvia's NATO membership. I experienced both of these events as moments of profound personal triumph. As, a, as the victory of a girl destined for lifetime of unfreedom over the forces of real politic. In fact, it can be said that only accession to the EU and NATO marked the true end of the Second World War in the Baltic states. We were finally secure and the destiny and orientation of our countries were in our hands only. Uh, Dear Fiona, your book is truly ambitious, and there are several subjects that I would be interested in discussing further, but I am limited in time. I need to be selective. Personally, I was touched by your discussion on gender discrimination through experiences from your career that you have bravely shared with us. Upon reading several passages, I could feel my heart Rate racing up. Yes, I have had to endure similar things, being called similar names, dealing with unflattering prejudices and assumptions based on my gender, among several other unacceptable behaviors that are normalized in this old boys' club world order, whether in politics or business. Unfortunately, I must admit that in my professional path, I have largely accepted many such instances of misogyny, exclusion, others taking credit of my, for my work and so on. But I did this, like also you did it, for the sake of accomplishing my goals and putting my country first. Yet now I understand that perhaps it was not the right thing to do, and I'm truly inspired by younger generations of women who are not afraid of confronting such discrimination vocally, publicly. Therefore, I also recommend your book as a guide and inspiration for all young women who aspire to pursue a career in male-dominated fields. In this regard, there really is no finer example than Fiona Hill, and I think the honesty with which you discuss these sensitive issues 
is an example to follow. Dear Fiona, I have been asked to say a few words about our European efforts to combat foreign interference in democratic processes, and I will do it. After all, the United States and Europe are being targeted by many of the same instruments, and as democratic societies share many of the same vulnerabilities. The very purpose of the Special Committee Report on Foreign Interference is the one you formulate in the introduction of your book. Democracy is not self-repairing. We cannot and must not take it for granted. It requires constant attention and renewal, especially during complicated periods, and we are in a complicated period. Like many of you in the audience today, I was shocked and devastated by watching the TV footage of the January 6 events coming from the Baltics, where the United States has played the most important role in helping us restore our independence and build strong democratic state from scratch and provided the NATO umbrella, we have always treated the United States as bastion of democracy globally. In these trying times for democracy around the world, America is irreplaceable. And it is my utmost wish for the American people to overcome your divisions. The world needs you. Those audible scenes reminded again to me, as well as to my colleagues in the European Parliament, that the US and EU have to be close allies in countering foreign interference by creating new global regulations to prevent digital wild west and manage disruptive technologies. Only by doing this can we hope to withstand the full arsenal of hybrid warfare measures used by hostile countries uh, against the West and our limited like-minded partners. The EU has woken up in this regard. Last month, we have passed the Digital Service Act, and I presume that Jens also voted for it, and the Digital Market Act will follow soon. These are two of the political and legal cornerstones in our attempt to create a safer digital space with fewer vulnerabilities that can be exploited, exploited by hostile actors. In our investigation, we highlight the challenges of attribution and retaliation of to foreign interference, it remains a low cost, low risk and high reward enterprise. For instance, we have seen that in numerous high profile instances, ranging from the Cambridge Analytica scandal to the recent cyber attacks in Ukraine, almost no one was held accountable. We are proposing some solutions in the report, for example, the establishment of a new sanctions toolkit specifically tailored for the legal and political realities of taking foreign, uh, tackling foreign interference. Understandably, online platforms are at the center of everybody's attention when we are discussing interference and disinformation. It is crucial that the EU and like-minded countries take the global lead in setting the rules of the game and forging ambitious legislation for the digital space to limit the unchecked power of the big tech platforms. And we also need stricter regulations for the data market. Also, large parts of the data brokering industry are legal. The reality is that we are operating in a digital wild west where several thousand loosely regulated private companies are possessing thousands of data points on individuals. The risk of malicious actors getting access to legally or illegally harvested data amplifies the hybrid threats we face with grave consequences for our economy, democracy, and security. However, the centerpiece of the efforts to counter foreign interference, whether in the EU, United States, or United Kingdom, must be resilience building. Indeed, the biggest chapter of my report compre comprehensively diagnoses the vulnerabilities in our democratic systems, institutions, and societies, and prescribes the way forward for building resilience through a whole of society approach. This whole of society approach must include dimensions of situational awareness, 
media literacy and education. And now I will say that I'm all very proud that the report touches upon very sensitive issues such as covered foreign funding and foreign interference via elite capture. We have identified uh, several loopholes which allow such covered foreign funding. The loopholes include lack of rules for online political advertising, fragmented legislation regarding financing of political parties across the EU, which very often lack clear spending limits in kind contributions to individuals such as loans, shell companies allowing a park financing, artificially created so-called civic or academic organizations with the purpose to funneling foreign money into the election processes. In effect, the problem of dirty money in politics is not just a well-worn cliche. It creates fertile ground for manipulation of our democratic systems. Furthermore, we must clearly and openly condemn and prevent all types of elite capture. The technique of co-opting top level officials, prime ministers and uh, speakers of parliaments, even commission presidents is used by foreign companies with links to governments actively engaged in interference actions against the EU or other democracies. Russia is the most successful in this, but China, Saudi Arabia and numerous other actors help former top-ranking European officials on state company boards. Such elite cooptation must have legal consequences and must be accompanied with severe sanctions, including immediate dismissal and or disqualification from future rec recruitment by the institutions. Declaration of income and property of such individuals should be made publicly available. Uh, dear Fiona, dear all, for me, it would be impossible to have a conversation today on the future of democracy without paying tribute to Ukraine, where democracy is under attack by hostile dictatorship. Are we willing to stand up for a country where more than 60% of people support EU and NATO membership? Or do we accept a return of 19th century spheres of influence for the sake of buying discounted Russian gas? Ukraine is, Ukraine is the test of our resolve and commitment to protecting each other, defending our values and guarding the rules-based international order. Europeans across the continent have finally to realize that we cannot just wish this problem to go away. We must deal with that in unity. We must avoid the temptations of Munich or new Yalta agreements. And to conclude, dear Fiona, dear all, I would like to conclude by once again thanking you for the privilege to speak here today. It gives me great confidence to be in a digital room, even with like-minded friends and partners who are convinced that Europe and the United States share many of the same threats to our democracies and many of the same vulnerabilities. It would be a mistake not to share our efforts. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Sandra Kelnietti. Thank you so much uh, for those remarks. And thank you too to Jens Geyer for um, really going down to the grassroots level of politics and showing how the issues which are raised in this book, There Is Nothing For You Here, really have resonance uh, throughout Europe today. Um, before we go over to Naya Benson to give uh, her particular perspective based on uh, years of uh, study and knowledge of uh, disinformation campaigns, I think it would be appropriate to ask Fiona if she has any comments based on the two distinguished respondents who've um, commented so far on the themes in her book. Over to you, Fiona. Just very briefly, I mean, <clears throat> first of all, um, it was very moving um, for me to, um, I'm sure it was for everyone to um, reflect on Sandra's experience. Um, the remarkable journey from a child in the Siberian Gulag to uh, the European Union. Um, I mean, that is really um, something to contemplate and also should give us, you know, hope in uh, the possibility of change, as well as uh, I think as Sandra is, is making an appeal for, 
a, a, a real focus on all of our half to reinvigorate our democracy so that we don't return to that kind of period or some form of that period in Europe or, or elsewhere. And, you know, obviously, as someone who's been experiencing you know, some of the recent changes here in the United States and watching some of them unfold, you know, I worry about the future of the United States democracy and, you know, also hope that we can learn from you know, the lessons uh, of, of other places about the real risks uh, that we run. I think what um, Ian said about um, uh, Essen and uh, the Ruhr Valley, you know, was also for me deeply moving, um, you know, I, I, I guess, and what you were describing them up, I remember, you know, sitting in my geography classes in school, uh, seeing the, the, the great sweep of the coal field, but I'd never thought about it in that way, realizing that I, absolutely miners in Essen and around Essen um, in uh, the, the rural valley were mining the same coal at one end uh, as my father was in the other. And it was all um, in uh, the mines that my father worked. It was anthracite, you know, obviously the richest uh, coal seams, but the seams were extraordinarily narrow. My father um, worked and I've been into those uh, drift mines uh, many times. Um, uh, I think, you know, as the end, uh, you were saying, it's very important to really kind of fully appreciate what those conditions were like for people as well as, as, as a kind of the way that it shaped um, mentality. Uh, my, the seams that my father worked in were literally only about, you know, this, this high and they had to crawl in, you know, to basically be able to get the, uh, the coal out. And they were like that for hours. Uh, you know, every day, and some of the mines, um, you know, as you're describing, particularly in the North Sea coast, went miles horizontally out to sea, deep underground, which of course made those working conditions extraordinarily dangerous. And that was in part why there was so such tight bonds of camaraderie, because people needed to create um, a strong culture and identity um, around uh, mutual assistance, because otherwise the risk of death in those circumstances was pretty high. And it, it does take some time to kind of appreciate uh, the way that, uh, um, you know, coal mining shaped uh, the the um, perspectives of, of everyone, historical and, you know, into the future. I mean, another um, element that often is missed um, in the larger context is that coal mining in some form went back to the Roman period. Uh, and maybe even earlier, but we have, you know, plenty of archaeological evidence of the Romans um, uh, adapting mining. Um, and where I grew up was also the northernmost limit of the Roman Empire. <laughs> so that's always a, a kind of a thing to uh, think as well that the Romans uh, maybe perhaps brought us coal mining <laughs> along with many other things of roads and forts and uh, sanitation and uh, heating. Uh, so anyway, lots of uh, uh, things to contemplate there in the historic context. And I think that, you know, what Jens said about those four factors that were pretty uh, crucial are going to be very important as we look to the next phase of um, industrial and economic transformation. The amount of money, time, political will uh, that is needed, but most essentially the uh, employee participation, workers' participation, people's participation, which is at the root of our democracy. And if we look around now um, in the United States, we're seeing uh, much more of an interest in creating new forms of association uh, by workers. There may be baristas in Starbucks, for example, or our research assistants in Brookings recently formed a union and uh, actually became a chapter of one of the larger amalgamated, I think the Auto Workers Union, which is a little mind blowing to think that research assistants at Brookings are part of the Auto Workers Union. But it's because we've lost a lot of the um, workers collectives that Europe and Germany in particular have maintained. I think that that's also kind of a lesson for moving forward is trying to figure out how we can create more of these mutual associations to give people a sense of a stake and a voice. And that was certainly lost in uh, the United Kingdom. And I think it just fits in you know, to some of the problems that we saw with Brexit. And we'll need that when we move into artificial intelligence, continue to move away from coal, hydrocarbons and the heavier industry into um, a, a new phase. And I think the European Union and the efforts that have been made in places like the Ruhr Valley and elsewhere can ha have a lot of lessons that they can transmit more broadly. So taking you know, what Sandra said at the end, uh, that it's very important for us like-minded countries to be working together and it fits in. And I think this is maybe a segue into what uh, Nadja is talking about. When people feel a stick and that they feel that they're committed to a shared endeavor, this isn't just something that's being imposed at the top or that others are considering for them. It does act as an antidote against the kind of disinformation and manipulation from the outside that we've seen of late. So I thought these were wonderful comments and very moving uh, for me as well to, you know, to listen uh, to both uh, Jens and Sandra. 
Thank you so much. Well, that's a perfect segue into Naya's remarks. Naya's works with us in the European Parliamentary Research Service. She's been on secondment to the Parliament's office, EPLO as we call it, the European Parliament Liaison Office in Washington, D.C. And this year, uh, she's taking a kind of year out there as German Marshall Fund and George Mason University fellow. So she has the benefit both of the academic perspective and the practitioner perspective. So over to you, Naya. Thank you very much, uh, Anthony, and uh, thank you very much for including me in this distinguished panel. And thank you to all three of you for everything I have learned today already in this very inspiring discussion, including about what you just said at the very end, uh, Fiona, about shared realities, which I think is a, warrants a discussion in itself. I'll highlight three aspects of your very inspiring book, Fiona. I'll start by zooming in on the personal level, then take a step back and focus more broadly on the societal and democratic vulnerabilities on our self-inflicted wounds, so to speak, before I end on a more practical or even tactical note, where I will try to link your work, your professional perspective and experience with the work of the European Parliament, including the very important role and work of Sandra and Jens, and also more specifically with the work and the mission of the European Parliament Liaison Office here in Washington. Firstly, the very personal way that you analyze the geopolitical and societal shifts that you have experienced and witnessed uh, from the UK, also from the, from the US perspective, perspective and as well as, as from the Russian perspective is one of the key aspects I think that really makes the book stand out and that resonate with all the readers that I have talked to so far. So the importance of personal integrity, standing up for what you believe in, being true to yourself and speaking truth to power is, as I see it at least, one of the underlying themes in your book. It's perhaps not the most visible one, but one that really struck a chord with me, especially with some traditional political and, and cultural role models crumbling in front of, of our very eyes. You have mentioned not only the tendencies of, of former President Trump, but also of his inner circle to prioritize personal benefits, personal gain over the common good over the nation, over democracy, over truth. And you mentioned that Trump's cronyist approach to the president presidency has been further encouraged by his fascination of, of Putin and, and other strong men. You call it autocrat envy. Trump was impressed and, and wanted to, to, to rule in a similar way and Trump has clearly served as inspiration for others with a certain divisive political culture spreading in and beyond Washington and even beyond the US. We all know that polarizing and divisive messages and rhetoric create more headlines and generate more engagement than boring, boring comp compromise, boring cooperation across political aisles. And we've seen that it takes a lot of strength to withstand the pressure. Um, and that a lack of guts, so to speak, makes you more vulnerable to pressure and even manipulation. You describe that uh, in your book. How important is the personal integrity in protecting and defending democracy on all levels of society? And how do you promote or encourage personal integrity, apart from, of course, honoring role models with prominent prizes like uh, the Nobel Peace Prize and the European Parliament's uh, Sakharov Prize. So now I'll zoom out to the democracy society dimension. In your book, you analyze the vulnerabilities, social vulnerabilities, lack of opportunity, lack of prospects, despair. And some of these vulnerabilities have become more visible during the pandemic. Some research has shown that voters, regardless of culture, gender, information access and language are more likely to perceive a candidate who obviously lies as authentically appealing if the if they the voters regard the political system as flawed if they think that the 
system is not working for them. And we know that the lack of opportunities that you describe and that some of it we have created ourselves, including racial, ethnic, societal inequality and, and inequity, these vulnerabilities actually create opportunities for those who want to undermine us. You, you mentioned that Putin's intuitive understanding of our vulnerabilities, and here I mean both in the US and, and in Europe, is directly linked to the grim, grim state that his country and his countrymen were in when he took over the reign. Sandra's report uh, that she has mentioned also warned that authoritarian state and non-state actors seek to exploit the vulnerabilities of societies, worsen the situation of vulnerable, vulnerable groups, which are more likely to become victims of disinformation. And I would just like you to, if, if you have, if, if you would like to elaborate a little on how our socio-economic vulnerabilities that are being weaponized by malign actors could potentially be taken into account when we think about national security. This also echoes uh, one of the points in, in Sandra's report. And finally, democracy is in retreat across the world. Sandra also mentioned the, 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 that and as well as the shock of, of January 6th. We know that the struggle between democracy and authoritarianism is not neatly confined uh, to separate geopolitical blocks of countries. We are seeing the blurred front lines between democracy and authoritarianism within our own borders and, and very visibly and dangerously in Ukraine right now. I mentioned individual role models before, personal integrity, and on a bigger scale, the European Parliament and the Congress as global flagships for democracy also function as role models, both domestically and internationally. So everything that our houses say and do, including on Ukraine, reflect on the state of our democracies. So they carry a significant responsibility for the perception of the functioning of democracy at home and in the world. So as Biden has said that we have to prove that democracy still works, that our government can deliver, deliver for the people. Um, and that is tied to the soft power protection. You write that America's polarization hindered the protection of soft power especially the power of example. We have parallel but very different debates in the US and in Europe about the future of democracy. In Europe, the debate on the future of the Conference of Europe has top priority in the European Parliament. I think there was at least some hope that the Summit for Democracy would rekindle the focus on the parliamentary dimension of democracy. But that perspective, when it finally emerged, seemed like a little bit like an afterthought. And we here in EPLO, of course, are always looking for synergies between the European Parliament and the Congress and seeking to explore them uh, further, including in our parliamentary dialogue between congressional members and, and, and MEPs, including on the issue of digital regulation as well as foreign interference, as Sandra has also mentioned. So with your experience, Fiona, and with your insight into both the US and the European vulnerabilities, perspectives, psyches, and political culture. Uh, how would you make the renewed focus on democracy as well as resilience to information manipulation on both sides of the Atlantic materialize in the ties between the European Parliament and the con Congress? How can we carve out our synergies and, and work together for the greater good for the voters and further develop a culture of Mutual, mutual assistance, as you said, Fiona, even with the polarization of the Congress and bearing the midterm elections in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Naya, for that. Uh, I'm going to hand the uh, baton now over to Joe, who's going to curate the discussion, and uh, Fiona, of course, will come back. And our two distinguished parliamentarians have the opportunity to come in and answer to any of the issues raised or questions posed. And as Joe, I think, will emphasize at various points, there's a chance for everybody who's online, the more than 100 people, to ask questions of the panel. So over to you, Joe. Thank you very much, Anthony. Um, thank you very much, Fiona, Sandra, Jens, and Naya for this uh, fascinating discussion, on which I think reflects the two 
uh, interconnected and interrelated themes of the book, uh, which is both the deindustrialization and and uh, and populism. In some sense, the the book is almost a, a primer on populism. I would say, but sort of seen through a uh, personal lens. But um, what I'd like to start with, and uh, we we have we have some some questions in, but and the first question from Adam Isaacs, in fact, uh, reflects the first question I was going to ask, but um, I want to pick up on the EU, EU US perspective, because as Naya rightly pointed out, this is the, the reason uh, the parliament has the office in, in Washington is to sort of cultivate the ties between the parliament and the, and the Congress. And also to pick up also what Sandra said about it being a witty book, um, I actually found um, a lot of linguistic uh, artistry in there. Um, uh, Naya picked up on uh, autocrat envy, which I particularly liked. Um, I think that uh, the title, the chapter, Me, the People, or in fact, Me, the People, is the, the shortest and most accurate definition of populism that exists, I think, um, in, in fact. And, and the whole book is, spells out in... I think very readable in a very readable way um, what that means. Uh, but the one I wanted to focus on uh, is the infrastructure of opportunity, um, which you use several times in your book, uh, which is a very nice, uh, I think, encapsulation of the phrase. And, and the, question, the first question I was going to ask, um, which actually ties in with the question we have from Adam Isaacs, is um, you identify that there are common problems. There's a kind of deindustrialization or Rust Belt problem in the UK, in the US, and to some extent in Russia. Although I come to that later if I have time to ask another question. Uh, but then the solutions uh, are going to be very different. I noticed in in um, the talk you had with Alexander Vinman, I think on the Lawfare podcast, that you came to this well. Okay, we have a common problem, but how do we how do we tackle it? So Jens described the European Union approach very well. So the sort of the public role and the solidarity, whereas the the US approach would be much more personal and um, sort of American dream category approach that people should sort of pull themselves up by their own book uh, bootstraps. But then you also described very effectively in the book. But the what did you call them? The um, unlucky generation. So the the, the millennials, millennials would not have had or would do not have the same opportunity that you had. And then uh, so this is what Adam has written in his question. He says that in his reading of the book, um, being left behind is mainly a factor of geography. And then he talks about the dynamic of. Um, you know, younger generations are being being denied the same opportunities that baby boomers and the next generation had. You know, free tuition versus student loan, and of course, student debt is a is a huge problem in the U.S. And he asks, how can we tackle this generational inequality? So that so if we could start with that, basically the the recipe for for solving the problem and how we can link that across the Atlantic. Yeah. Thank you so much, and I wanted to thank. Um, Naya um, uh, greatly as well for posing um, such um, you know wonderful sets of issues in different ways. I've been grabbing pieces of paper from my printer as we've been talking. <laughs> I started to, you know, I've been listening and I thought, oh my goodness, I must write all this down because this is just you know kind of wonderful. I would take one thing actually would be not necess not necessarily me, but I would certainly take. Naya, Sandra, and Jens on the road. Um, and I is already here in Washington DC, but you know, bring all of this together in discussions with congressional staff and members. Um, I was um, a week ago at the Helsinki Commission um, at the um, U.S. Congress, which of course is chaired by members of the Senate as well as members of Congress, and it's a bipartisan approach. And it was looking uh, right at the heart of the current Russian threat via Ukraine to um, uh, our broader European security architecture. Now, I think, you know, what we're talking about today fits into this, particularly if you have to take the starting point of Sandra's life story, which is, you know, remarkable itself. Um, and as Sandra was speaking, I was feeling, you know, kind of goosebumps because I was just sort of imagining 
you know, that that sweep of your life and you're still with us. Thank God, Sandra, <laughs> kind of, you're not that old. Uh, it's, it's basically like bearing witness to an incredible transformation of uh, the European space in terms of um, security and opportunity. Uh, and, you know, the ways you describe when Latvia joins the European Union, Union, picking up on my point of opportunity or the infrastructure of opportunity, it suddenly becomes very different. Jens is talking about at the micro level about how you can transform uh, in a place um, like uh, Essen and uh, the Rural Valley. I also found that, as I said, uh, deeply inspiring. As you said, it hasn't been uniform across the way, uh, but um, there are still, um, as you said, there are um, quarters or uh, quartals in um, uh, Essen and some places that still feel left behind. But you talked about that negligence of public goods, um, which is also kind of tied to our negligence then of the public good of democracy. Because, you know, getting to what Sandra has said, what you've said, Joe, and what Adam, you know, was saying in that uh, in the uh, discussion by um, a chance of geography about where you live, um, the case, my case in the northeast of England, uh, but, you know, it could be parts of, uh, you know, the rural valley that haven't moved along as you know far as others have, certainly the Rust Belt in the United States. People have felt, um, you know, kind of a, a great deal of anger and frustration uh, because they don't have the opportunities that others have had. But they also, um, on Jens's point, haven't seen any improvement in their school streets and services. That's, you know, part of that infrastructure, the basic level of opportunity. Um, if you don't have, uh, you know, all if you have is potholes in the streets or your transportation has broken down, you can't get from A to B, your public services have broken down you know, having to take care of a lot of things yourself and your schools are inadequate uh, for, uh, you know, basically pre preparing you for the present as well as uh, the future, you are already at a, a massive uh, disadvantage. And that fits into uh, Nadia's point about how do you deal with this, you know, kind of fundamental sets of problems? I mean, I would argue that the uh, socioeconomic aspects, the spatial inequalities, these are all tied together uh, with the um, uh, our democratic prospects. And if we're asking about, you know, how can we um, deal with this, uh, which, you know, Adam is asking and Joe is asking, I think you have to kind of pull these things together. Now, I think at some level, the Biden administration has understood this. You know, the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, um, during his sabbatical from government, spending time at, uh, at the Carnegie Endowment, looking at a foreign policy for the middle class. Uh, clearly, um, President Biden has this very ambitious agenda um, uh, with the infrastructure bill addressing the basic negligence of public goods that Jens has, Jens has talked about, but it has to be, you know, done in a congressional setting through the budget uh, frame. And then he had this, you know, larger ambitious um, uh, companion bill, which obviously hasn't uh, got anywhere at the moment, uh, which was the Build Back Better, which is, you know, very similar in idea to the British uh, now um, approach or policy of trying to level up. You've just had the British white paper on leveling up uh, that's come out. But it is also, you know, rooted in uh, some of the approach of the European Union on regional funds, structural funds, and, you know, some of the various funding that you said, Joe, has put together in a public uh, perspective. Um, about the, the kind of public role in looking for reconstruction and, you know, redevelopment. And as a younger person in the UK, you know, as I said, I was 10 when the UK, uh, UK joined the EU, the UK actually benefited greatly uh, in the 1980s and 1990s from that kind of funding. And then, you know, kind of as a perception that it sort of went away, though it actually didn't in Northern England. You know, the, the, the European symbol was still on road signs, you know, in the northeast of England and on local technical schools uh, on sort of skills redevelopment. It wasn't the UK government that was bringing that. There was actually investment from the EU coming back into the area, but that got lost in the mix. So what you need to do is bring that into the public perspective and, you know, getting into both um, Adam's uh, question and Joe and, and Naya's yours. I mean, I think that the European Parliament can play a very important role by bringing to the United States representatives like Sandra and Jens to talk very practically about what you've done. And there is both the public element to this, as we try to see in the legislature of members of Congress trying to pass legislation that facilitates the development of the physical infrastructure, the public goods, as well as the infrastructure of opportunity. You saw that, for example, the uh, First Lady, uh, Jill Biden, has spoken out with great sorrow about the loss now of funding for community colleges 
in uh, the United States. She herself teaches in a community college. In the United States, a community college is the place where people can go to learn new skills and to adapt themselves for the changes in the economy. And, you know, as you uh, suggested, uh, Joe, people find themselves weighed down under massive amounts of debt. I mean, I say in the book and just all the time that I was unbelievably lucky. I wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for grants and subsidized education. There's no way I could have had any of these educational um, opportunities. There is one way, though, in the United States where philanthropy can play a role. The corporate sector can play a role. I mean, one thing that some of my European colleagues have pointed out to me in writing the book was absolutely what you just said, Joe. The book ends with what we can do individuals, you know, to try to push things forward rather than, you know, kind of, you know, what the, the uh, public sector, the United States government should be doing. That's embedded in the book and it talks of, you know, different approaches to development and the, the US government has tried to pick that up. But we can see in the US context that sometimes it's just too big. So I think there actually has to be some examples of what you can do on a local and regional level, which Jens is talking about, which, you know, and, and breaking down Jens would also be useful for a US audience about how much was public sector, you know, the larger scale coming from the German government or the European um, institutions, and how much was it done by local effort? You know, you talked about, you know, the the, um, the role of uh, people in the, um, uh, you know, the kind of basically employees participation, uh, the kind of the workers collectives, um, well, well, local assets pooled together. Um, Germany and other European countries also have large philanthropic entities. You know, how much did, did they come into play? I, I talk a lot in the book about um, the experience of my uh, father and my grandparents in these mining villages in the northeast of England, in which the miners association uh, basically pooled together the miners own assets, their dues, the money that they earned in the mines. And then the money from, you know, maybe other benefactors and created local welfare associations. Uh, the idea of welfare has got distorted in the United States, but it meant the general well-being. It's actually in the preamble to the U.S. Constitution about, you know, kind of working in the general welfare, the, the, the general good. And they created what they called welfare associations that were cultural, but also self-help for the miners. Uh, and that were also, was also a kind of a point of um, uh, where if you were looking uh, to the present time, a bit like the workers' collectives or, you know, some of the associations that you see in Germany and elsewhere, those funds can be used also for local regeneration, particularly at the micro level. So I think that if we, you know, look at, uh, again, the question that um, Adam um, uh, posed and that you framed there, Joe, and the things that, you know, Naya was also talking about, there's different ways of creating the infrastructure of opportunity, and I think there's a lot of lessons that the United States could learn that could maybe help to tackle some of this legislative um, uh, obstruction that we're seeing. I, I can imagine, you know, someone like uh, Jens sitting down with the staff of Joe Manchin from West Virginia, for example, and talking about how, you know, transition was actually affected, not to try to influence, you know, kind of the politics here, uh, but to actually just sort of explain about how things were done. You know, maybe um, when we get out of our COVID restrictions, Thinking about um, some of your codels and, you know, kind of liaison outreach, you could do some of it on Zoom, but actually taking people to see things, you know, with their own eyes, not always just taking it to the level of going to Strasbourg or, you know, going to Brussels, but out there to the Ruhr or, you know, to parts of, you know, old industrial Latvia and, you know, other places that, you know, that we have. So I can see an awful lot of prospect and promise here for um, the parliamentary li liaison office to push things forward. Thank you, Fiona. I was going to say, and I actually know that Jens is planning to come to Washington, we hope this year, so maybe some of these points, he can act on some of these points. Uh, could I hand, hand the floor back to you, Jens, and after that then to Sandra, just for some reactions to what the very interesting um, uh, suggestions and proposals that Fiona has just made. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, thanks. Thanks for the question. Thanks uh, for for the inspiring um, uh, discussion that we that we can have here. I I, I listened to uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, interest. What you have all contributed? Fiona asked how much private effort, how much um, public money, how much state money, how much. European money. I think it was done by all levels because there was a huge, um, huge agreement in German politics that we just don't let 
down a whole region that is going to be deindustrialized. So in the 1960s, it started with a structural crisis of German coal mining industry because this stuff simply became too expensive. And um, uh, then uh, on all on all levels, it started to uh, to, to to reconstruct. Okay, we have uh, we are a federal state, so the level of the of the of the lender in my case, Nordrhein-Westfalen, is very important. For example, um, the state of Nordrhein-Westfalen set up four universities in the region. So, given giving by that opportunities to people who had to travel elsewhere before to get an uh, an academic um, uh, an academic. Uh, um degree yeah there was the 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 big university at bochum before and uh, all the other universities were about 100 kilometers away so four universities made academics affordable for everybody who who had the had the simple uh, had the what the uh, had qualified secondly um i talked about um the the participation schemes that we have in in in, in german economy so that enabled um the employees to have a say in which direction their enterprises go and that could simply say no if somebody wanted simply to shut down things um that was uh, that is a regulation part it was a lot of a lot of national money because we summed up the coal mining industry on one state enterprise, Rukul AG, and it was heavily subsidized with, with national money in order to bring down the price of the coal and make it um, make it compatible. Um, and um, that was always a struggle with the European Union because state subsidies always is has to be um, accepted by the European Commission. So we had to show that it goes down. So the subsidies will have an end that was set for 2019 um, and that uh, that it is not um, that it is not against the the uh, the common market and i remember a lot of um, british enterprises going to the european court um, and and trying to sue germany because of this subsidies yeah, so um, it was it was a, an, an effort on all levels. When it comes to the public goods that I mentioned, this they are mainly in um, the responsibility of the munis munis municipalities. And here is the weak spot. Um, so um, under under two Christian Democratic chancellors, um, the opportunities of the municipalities has been. Uh, going down because more and more of the social expenditures have been shifted to the municipalities while they were going to let's say save uh, um, the national money um, uh, for, for other reasons so that was uh, when when germany had the um what was in danger of creating something like we that we called a two-third society so two-third very well off one-third left to whoever is caring for them. And it was a political effort uh, um, to, to, to undergo that and, and not make it happen. But the weak spot are still the municipalities who are almost bankrupt. So that is the political level who cares for the quality of the streets, the quality of the sub social services, the public goods, um, um, the, um, how the schools look and what services the municipalities can have. And the frustration that we witness in the Rust Belt or in, 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 uh, in the northeast of England with this very, with the populist um, uh, reaction to that is felt also in my home area in the very quarters which are the worst off. Uh, so there is still things to do. It is not so much European money, Fiona, because um, given to the amount of money that was needed just to save my home region, there is never enough European money. But it helps here and there. It helps here and there. So um, 
um, but but it depends finally on what the municipality and the region make out of the European money. So maybe maybe for you coming from a coal mining area, it is it is uh, interesting to hear that one of the most modern coal mines opened uh, about 100 years ago is now uh, a, a world cultural heritage. Yeah? So we, we preserved that place and made it um, a museum, but also a, a place where now more people are working than in the times uh, when it was an active coal mine. And we are still proud of it because we think it's the most beautiful coal mine in the world. And um, there is a river a river in, in the north of the Ruhr area is called Emscher that has been an open sewer canal for about 100 years. And with European money, we change it now and make it a, a re, re, in German, we would say re-naturalize it. We think that doesn't make much sense in English, but um, we make it from a from a sewer canal back to a, a normal flowing blue clean river. So what has been the backyard of a city becomes all of a sudden the garden, and by that we hope to lift the dignity of the people a bit. So it's it's a, it's an all levels approach, and um, um, it is then yeah also the art of politics to to make a. Uh, a reform concept out of it that finally that finally works. Thank you. That's uh, very inspiring, Jens. Would you like to add briefly to that, Sandra? Because I want to ask Fiona a question about her time in the White House. I think we, we can't have a book talk without asking Fiona to say a little bit more than she says in the book. I know I'm, yeah, Sandra is right. Um, because when I was listening to Jens and also to Fiona, I all the time I was comparing the experiences because just try to imagine uh, where from Latvia comes now 30 years after. And I think the image which um, describes the most um, uh, illustrative in, in most illustrative way would be then I compare and I'm speaking in Latvians, I compare that if we would not join European Union um, and choose a path of democracy, then today we would be like Moldova. Of course, if I compare uh, and Latvia with Denmark, then we are like Moldova for Denmark still, but we are developing all the time. And, and that is the huge advantage. And just two, uh, two um, uh, uh, we are paying into EU budget each individual in Latvia, 169 euros. We are receiving from EU budget 694. And without this, uh money which is coming into our country first it was pre-accession programs now it's in a full budget budget scale we never could make that difference which differs us from moldova today and also our population would be much more um, disappointed uh, however there is something which always keeps us together this is the permanent experience of danger, uh, what we are feeling on our eastern border. Uh, this is present from the first day of recovery of our independence, and it's particularly vivid now, because Latvia is considering to, um, to enlarge our uh, defense budget to 2.5 from budget uh, from uh, GDP. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Sandra. Yes, Fiona, obviously, um, I saw that you were taking notes again, so I you probably want to come back uh, on these comments, but I wanted to ask you a second question, really, uh, because I found, found that you're your book had some uh, surprising equivalences in a way, like 
comparing Trump and Putin, which you explained very well, but I would say it's a little bit counterintuitive. You also have a lot in your book about saying that shock therapy in, in Russia in 1992 was kind of in a way roughly the equivalent of Thatcherism or Reaganism, um, and that Russia went this through this sort of accelerated deindustrialization. But um, I found that personally a little bit, little bit surprising because uh, it's surely my own limitation, but I always had Russia in a separate mental category and, and always thought of it as, in a sense, um, Russia reverting, uh, reverting to form. Uh, the, the where, of course, these terrific hopes which uh, the European Parliament shared and uh, shared in, and there was an assumption somehow that um, democracy in Russia would come by itself with the economic transformation, but um, that's not, of course, what happens. So in that in that context, I wanted to ask you, um, particularly as I think some of the, the personal aspects in your book, the trauma of the Helsinki press conference, to describe brilliantly, and the um, also the, the lead up to your um, deposition, if that's the word, in, in the Congress, in the impeachment hearing. Um, this all kind of adds tremendous texture to, to your 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 narrative on on populism, and so my sub question, and the one I perhaps wanted to focus drill in on, drill down on, was narrative creation. I think I remember in your book, um, I'm not absolutely certain that you wrote it, that you talked about the origin, for example, of uh, the this Shoros myth, you know, that uh, Orban, Orban's attack on, on Shoros. And I think you talked about when that was actually invented or, or thought up and, and how you describe how it was used. And you, of course, link that to many other populist narratives. Perhaps you could just tell us, um, pick it up from there. Okay. Thanks so much, Joe. I mean, that's a lot of um, good questions there. Um, in terms of just the, the first place that you started um, about, you know, kind of thinking about Russia on a separate track, um, you know, as I explained in, uh, you know, in the book, I mean, obviously, I have a very different perspective of the way that I came to Russia. Um, so, uh, you know, partly I saw a lot of things that I wouldn't have seen you know, had I started coming, you know, to Russia from the perspective of, you know, someone from a very different background, looking at just, you know, kind of through the kind of Western lens of a sort of a prosperous, you know, part of, of Europe or the United States. I mean, I grew up in what was rapidly becoming the Rust Belt, again, in a region that was completely 100% dominated by nationalized industries. And, of course, the transformation in uh, the United Kingdom under Thatcher or the United States under Reagan um, at the macro level, actually might look quite successful, but at the micro level, um, you know, if you're sitting somewhere like in the northeast of England or you're sitting in Flint, Michigan, you know, in the United States or one of the old textile towns of Western Massachusetts, it looks very different. Um, a, a kind of a, a massive economic transformation um, away from huge industries, you know, be it driven by larger global factors, as Jens uh, was pointing out. It's also the same in the United Kingdom, of course, that coal became... Uh, less profitable or, you know, kind of harder uh, to maintain at the industrial levels that we've built up after um, World War II, but beginning in the 1960s, it's certainly the case that my father lost his jobs in the coal mines in the 60s. Uh, but it was the massive de-industrialization um, that came as a result of the privatization under Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s that had led the most devastating blows to um, the whole uh, northeast of England and the fact of the miners' strike of 1984-1985, which then precluded the kind of uh, slower transition that Jens talked about. I mean, I um, I've had the occasion, you know, later on in my life uh, to meet, you know, senior members of the Conservative Party and uh, Thatcher's cabinet who said that there was an attempt or a talk behind the scenes to try to do what Jens was talking about, find some kind of subsidisation over a longer, you know, period which might have been difficult, but would have cushioned the blow and perhaps, you know, given uh, some opportunity to move things in something of a different direction socially, uh, but was politically um, unfeasible uh, by the time you got to the minor strike, because you then this had this massive clash between Margaret Thatcher and, um, uh, you know, kind of basically the, the miners union, which became highly personalised. 
um, with um, anywhere. Uh, I don't need to go into the history of that clash. I think many people, you know, can certainly, you know, read about it and think about, you know, the, 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 but that in itself was a turning point. And so when you go to Russia in the 1990s, and I was there for most of that period, uh, working on technical assistance projects, there was that rapid with shock therapy, almost the same as the kind of overnight privatization under, you know, Thatcher. I mean, people tend to forget that, you know, Thatcher came in in 1979, but the kind of like the peak of um, the, the transformation is really in that 80, 81, and then up to 1984 and 1985 with the miners' strike. And um, in the case of shock therapy in Russia, there was this idea that if you tinkered with the system, you would transition in a six to one year, um, six month to one year time frame. That was un unrealistic. It was ridiculous, in fact, to think it. And as you know, kind of then a you know relatively junior person having just come from the northeast of England, I thought, well, this isn't going to work. <laughs> but you know, I wasn't Jeffrey Sachs or you know, kind of one of the you know the the larger economists here. I was just speaking from my own personal experience, and those kind of voices got lost in the mix. And just as Jens was saying, there was no consultation. This was you know a bunch of uh, you know economic reformers. Uh, you know, kind of who were um, put forward by the Kremlin, but had been steeped in Milton Friedman and in the Washington consensus. And we're looking at, you know, Reaganomics and Thatcher economics and thinking that you took away the Communist Party, you privatized everything and suddenly voila, you get a democratic, you know, um, a market economy and, you know, the rest is history. Well, um, in fact, that was not the case. And so then you kind of get populism and you get um, Vladimir Putin and you get to, you know, the other part of your you know, kind of question here where people are always looking for scapegoats for why things have happened. And the, the scapegoats, you know, kind of often become someone like a George Soros, um, who was targeted not just because he is, you know, kind of a wealthy oligarch, you know, businessman who's funding all kinds of what people would perceive as left wing causes, but, you know, very bluntly because he's Jewish. And although that's not how it started out, you know, I talk in the book and I actually said it during my impeachment trial that the targeting of Soros started to become something like the old uh, anti-Semitic myths, like the elders of uh, the protocols of Zion that was, um, you know, roiled Europe and a lot of European politics beginning in the 1900s, which though it wasn't invented by the Tsarist uh, secret police, it became used by them to go after political opponents. And the Soros myth of his intervention uh, you know, first was devised by a couple of um, political operatives in New York to be Jewish themselves. They didn't envisage it as being anti-Semitic. They thought it was kind of a useful tool. They had worked actually very closely with Bibi Netanyahu um, in Israel, and it was he who recommended them uh, to um, Viktor Orban. They were close friends. So obviously, the religious um, or anti-Semitic elements of this wasn't foremost, but that's what it became over time. And, uh, you know, the whole Soros myth of Soros interfering and trying to kind of bring down Western politics, you know, beginning in Hungary, they were trying to look for a kind of a foil for Viktor Orban and Soros was a very useful one. And over time, it's been used by all kinds of different uh, political operatives and including, you know, by Donald Trump and others. And, you know, it's still, um, still ongoing. So, you know, what I wanted to talk about in the populist terms was how people look for scapegoats. And unfortunately, under the weight of history, some of those scapegoats um, find, you know, traditional historic form and often, you know, kind of morph into other things. And, you know, that becomes, you know, kind of a, a part of a way of deflecting uh, attention from the deep roots of some of our socioeconomic problems and looking for, you know, rather facile, you know, political reasons uh, for why things haven't been tackled. Because ultimately, it's extraordinarily difficult, as Jens has underlined, to do the kinds of things that are necessary to transform socioeconomically, or it takes an extraordinary long time, as Sandra has underscored, for political transformation, decades. Um, and, you know, um, uh, starting in the gulag and then moving to the present time, that's an incredible sweep of history. And as, you know, uh, Naya's work is pointing out, it's incredibly easy uh, to manipulate all of this because it's incredibly difficult to fix it. So populism short circuits the whole process and says, well, look, the reason for all this has happened is not this great sweep of history, <laughs> but is in fact this particular group uh, or that particular group who are, you know, somehow working uh, contrary to your interests. Yes, thank you, Fiona. I think that's a, a terrific way to end and also very happy that um, we, we've come the conclusion, I think, in this during the discussion that for the transatlantic cooperation and perhaps a uh, visit to Washington uh, by uh, Sandra and Jens would be very, very appropriate and um, would certainly uh, consult you on that, Fiona. Um, 
Do, do any of anybody want to say a last word? Uh, I'm tempted to hand back to Anthony, but perhaps Sandra or Jens or Naya want to say a last word if or Fiona herself. I think we covered a vast, vast ground, vast terrain. I system. just want to say thank you for the opportunity, honestly. I mean, for me, you know, as, as well as, I mean, everyone here, um, you know, the transformation that I experienced um, over the course of my life was unimaginable. Perhaps not as unimaginable as Sandra, uh, which is really on the scale of utterly remarkable. But, you know, for someone coming from where I did, it was, and honestly, the EU played an important role. That's why I said as a personal level, it was deeply upsetting for me that the UK would pull out of uh, the European Union because I'm very cognizant of the personal benefits that that gave to me, not just the national benefits that, you know, kind of got lost in the mix, you know, irrespective of you know, some of the questions about EU reform and, you know, other deficiencies, you know, kind of uh, large bureaucracies. But I think it was a it was a tragedy that um, that this happened, you know, personally from a personal perspective. So I'm very grateful on the personal level to still have the opportunity, you know, to to work uh, with colleagues and to have, you know, been able to participate in something like this. And we're tremendously grateful to you, Fiona. And thank you also for me to Sandra and Jens and Naya. Uh, Anthony, could I hand back to you at 10.59? So I think we can finish exactly, exactly on time. Well, thank you very much indeed, Joe, and thank you to uh, Fiona and uh, to, to Jens, to Sandra, to Naya, uh, and to everybody who's been online and sharing their insights and reflecting on some really quite important issues, uh, all prompted by this great book, There's Nothing For You Here, which will shortly be available in the European Parliament uh, Library, both online and physically. Um, this was the first of a, a mini series of EPRS book talks, which we're planning to do with the European Parliament Liaison Office in Washington, DC, and there'll be several others during the course of the year. But the next EPRS policy roundtable will be on Tuesday, the 22nd of February, and it'll be with the OECD in Paris. And we'll be discussing um, work that they've been doing on well-being in, in the pandemic, living with the coronavirus crisis. It's about the effects uh, in terms of personal lives, in terms of the working environment, in terms of uh, wider societal public goods, if you like, uh, concerning the impact of COVID-19. And that'll be at lunchtime, as I say, on Tuesday, the 22nd of February. So we look forward to seeing as many of you as possible for that event. And also to express our collective thanks to Fiona and the other panelists for this really excellent and very enjoyable book talk. Thank you so much indeed, everybody and have a very enjoyable rest of the day.